Okay, well, uh, welcome back, everyone. I'm really delighted to um, welcome folks from Big Law. We have Claude Stern, uh, Kristen McDonald, and Marcy Fitzsimmons. Uh, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to them to say a few words about what they do, what their daily -day lives are like, uh, what's good, what's challenging, and how they got there. And then we'll open it up to some questions. So why don't I start with Kristen? Sure, just a quick introduction, right? Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kristen McDonald. Uh, I graduated from Hastings in 2015. Um, I am an attorney at O'Melveny Myers in San Francisco. Um, back to you know the downtown office as of the beginning of this month, and it's it's actually been great. Um, you know, people have different preferences on working from home versus in the office. I thought I could be a 100% work from home person, and it turns out I'm not. I much prefer uh, going into the office and kind of having a dedicated space for work. So um, as you can see from my background, I'm in the office. Um, I'm a, a counsel, which at O'Melveny is, um, you know, the, the title that you get when you're, you know, essentially a senior associate. And I think it's after five years, um, you know, you, you get that title. So I'm about to wrap up my sixth year. Um, I do labor and employment. Um, I would say, you know, 70-ish percent of my work is done for airline clients. That's just like a big field and industry that our firm in general practices in. Um, we've done a lot with, um, you know, mergers and things like that on the like antitrust and um, corporate side. But we also do a ton of the airlines labor and employment work. And it's it's really fascinating stuff because they've got, um, you know, large unionized workforces with nationwide CBAs and there's interesting federal preemption arguments as well um, that are starting to kind of work their way up to the Supreme Court right now, which is very cool. Um, so that's a, a big chunk of what I do. I also do a lot of work for um, hotels, you know, kind of hospitality industry. Um, I've done a little bit of work for tech companies, kind of NDAs and stuff like that. I do a little bit of, um, you know, like single plaintiff um, discrimination lawsuits, things like that. And also internal investigations, which are really cool. Um, sometimes those are brought by, um, you know, a governmental agency, a DOJ or an AG's office or something like that. Um, and other times they're prompted by sort of just, you know, public opinion and like a news article that comes out that that paints a corporation in a less than positive light, um, you know, from a kind of equity perspective in, in employment and things like that. So that's a, another big part of my practice. Um, very cool, very interesting work. And I'm excited to, you know, talk a little bit more about it with you guys today. Thank you very much, Kristen. Uh, Marcy. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Marcy Fitzsimmons. Um, I'm at a law firm called Gordon Reese Scully Manzacani. Um, I technically work out of our San Francisco office, but I um, actually work remotely and have prior to the pandemic most of the time, um, which works really well for me. So that background that's um, blurred back there, you may or may not occasionally see a cat tail popping up, but that's just sort of what happens around here. Um, I am a partner in our employment group. I graduated from Hastings in 2003, and I have been with Gordon and Reese since I was a summer associate there in 2002. Um, so I've spent my entire career in the employment group at, at the firm. Um, I've seen it grow from a small, primarily, or mid, small to mid-sized, primarily California-based firm to now being the 24th largest firm in the country and having offices throughout the country in every state. So um, I've been through quite a bit of growth with the firm. Um, as far as my practice goes, I do mainly single plaintiff cases, um, employment cases. I do um, a lot of advice and counseling for my clients and serve as outside general counsel for several clients. I also do a lot of Title IX work we represent a lot of um, universities and other schools in, um, in the Bay Area, especially. And so a lot of, I've been doing a lot of their employment work for a long time. Um, and it naturally has led into doing some Title IX work as well. 
Um, I also, I, I represent a variety of different clients, but I also represent a lot of healthcare providers as well. And it's, it's a very interesting area of the law for me, um, especially now during the pandemic, there's been a lot of really interesting COVID related issues that have come up. Um, and so that's, that's my practice in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Um, Claude, how about you? Oh, Claude, you're on mute. Sorry about that. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Claude Stern. I graduated from Hastings in 1980, which is well before uh, any of you were born or most of you were born. Um, I uh, have practiced litigation for 41 years, but I'm delighted to say that on May 1st of this year, I retired from uh, Quinn Emanuel, where I was co-chair of the firm's uh, intellectual property group. Uh, which is the largest group in the firm for the last uh, 18 years. Um, I, uh, after I, after a brief background, I started with a federal clerkship for a Ninth Circuit judge in Seattle, Washington after graduating, and then uh, went to Morrison and Forrester, and then from there went to a variety of other firms. I was a partner at four other firms in my career. Um, and my practice was entirely litigation. Uh, it was mostly federal litigation, mostly defense side work. Uh, but because I started practicing in intellectual property in 1984, um, uh, I began to develop a significant Silicon Valley and technology practice group. And although I started my practice in San Francisco, um, I moved down to the Silicon Valley in the early 90s, um, which was a huge move in, uh, in hindsight was probably the most important move of my career. Um, but largely, I, uh, I, I uh, tried cases around the country for um, over 30 years in a patent, copyright, trademark, or trade secret cases. That led to an enormous amount of class action work for those same clients that I was the, their technology litigation for. So, and I'm happy to talk to you this morning. Great. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, why don't you say a little bit about some of the challenges uh, that you face, um, not just on a you know, day to day basis, but maybe on a year to year basis? What are some of the trade offs that you um, that you have to accept for having the job that you love? Um, Claude, let's start with you. That's a that's a big question. Um, these are all very personal decisions that we all make. Um, I think that uh, what I did, um, I don't know if I did it intentionally but I certainly made a choice to devote myself almost religiously to the practice of law and to trial work. Um, uh, it's you talk about the sacrifice. One of the big questions I think is what sort of firm you're going to go to, uh, what sort of environment you want to put yourself in. Um, I went from a, uh, from Morrison Forrester. I was an associate for two years. I was headhunted away in the early eighties to a small litigation shop called Horwich and Warner. It was, Hor it was litigation and corporate it was nine lawyers. I became a partner at that firm um, after three years, and um, that was a great law firm. It was a small firm, and I had a—I um, I could honestly say it was the least number of billable hours that I was billing on a relative basis in my career. But as I got into my career, I began to become more devoted, and um, quite frankly, the. Uh, if you do what you're loving um, and you love what you're doing, uh, you, the, the hours disappear. Um, so I started working harder and harder. And I think that's the biggest challenge, frankly. Uh, people talk about a, about a life-work balance. Um, I am um, not proud to say this, but I don't think I had much of a life-work balance for most of my career. Um, I was working much harder than a lot of other lawyers were. And I think that's a big cost of, of going to... Um, depending on the firm you go to, uh, to the firms that you go to. I, I will say one thing, I think one of the biggest challenges that all of you have today, and that I think lawyers have today, is there's a strong tendency among lawyers and law firms to specialize. And so at Quinn Emanuel, I had partners who only practiced patent litigation. I have partners who only practice trademark litigation or only class action defense work. Um, I was never such a person, although I ended up having a, an enormous amount of business in the intellectual property litigation field, uh, I made it very clear to all my clients that um, I was willing to help them in any area that they needed help. And uh, if, if uh, I showed you my resume, which I, I don't think is any longer on the firm, but it's about 27 pages long, 
Um, I have substantial litigation experience in all areas, tried cases in all sorts of areas. Um, and I think there's the movement in the practice of law now to prevent that or to have people focus on an area and become a specialist. And quite frankly, I, I was my, my uh, appetite was never such that I would be interested in only doing one sort of case. Um, I think that's the beauty of law, especially if you develop strong skills, is that you, um, you can practice litigation and resolve disputes in any area. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I think that was the biggest challenge, it, it actually wasn't a challenge. This is to be pretty, if somebody asked me what was the smartest decision I ever made in the practice of law, um, the answer is really simple. It was, I was an enormous opportunist. And that means that when any sort of case came my way or any sort of client came my way and it was an opportunity for me to um, show that client what I could do or to take on a new case to test my skill set, I did. Uh, and it ended up, uh, I didn't end up being an intellectual property litigation specialist uh, with a pretty well uh, rounded reputation nationwide. Um, by intentionally focusing in that area. Uh, when I was um, my fourth year, I was in the fourth year associate, a partner came into my office, threw a file on my desk and said it was a copyright case the firm just had. Would I be interested in working on it? And um, I had my first solo federal trial in my fifth year as an associate. And um, that case and the success in that case prompted a bunch of very big clients to call me. And that really started my career. And if I could give advice to any of you, the advice I would give is this, obviously be careful what law firm or what law environment you pick, make sure it fits you. But most important, be opportunistic. Um, uh, sometimes uh, the bluebird of happiness doesn't arrive as the bluebird of happiness. It just simply shows up on your doorstep in another form. And I would strongly recommend experimenting and trying various things. And you may, may find out that you fall into the thing that you love. Thanks, Claude. Um, uh, Kristen, what about challenges for you? Um, yeah, well, well, you had said trade-offs at first, and I was thinking about that. And um, me personally, I don't feel like there's really been a ton of trade-offs. I, I don't feel like I'm sacrificing a ton to have this job. I feel like I get to do this job. I really do feel like it's a privilege and I'm sometimes still shocked at, you know, that, that this is what I get to do. I will say though, that I don't think the, the job, I mean, it requires a lot of weekend work, a lot of night work, and it, it's a job that does sort of um, uh, take over your life as maybe a, a an exaggeration, but it, it certainly takes up more space, I think, within a person's life than, than other sorts of jobs might. Um, I was a teacher for a few years, a, a high school teacher before I was a, uh, before I went to law school and pursued a legal career. Um, and teaching actually is a, a pretty all-consuming job as well, at, at, I think at any stage of education. Um, it's certainly not as well compensated as law. So I will say when I, you know, became a lawyer, I was sort of like, again, just I felt very privileged to be able to, to do this and, and to be paid well and to get to do cool work and kind of increase my um, responsibilities and, and skills, you know, progressively over the years. Um, but I, I will say just because I've observed other people, my, my husband included, who is a lawyer and a very different kind of lawyer, um, that you know, if big law just, is, it, it isn't for everybody. And if you have a personality, um, like my husband, for instance, he's just, he, he's a very like big picture thinker, um, not as great about kind of attention to detail. And he's just very kind of, um, he's just way more of like a, a people person. He wants to have a job where he's kind of up and around and meeting with people and solving people's problems and, you know, sitting and drafting briefs and, you know, researching on Westlaw is not really his thing. Um, he worked at a, at a large law firm and, you know, left after about a year because it, it, it just wasn't for him. And so I think you do need to think about that, like what kinds of, you know, things do you want to be doing on a daily basis? Are you someone who is okay with, you know, sitting in an office kind of 
quietly for a lot of the day, researching, writing, reviewing documents, because that is what you're going to be doing for the first few years at least. Um, and that won't always be the case. You know, you'll start doing, um, you know, depots and witness interviews and court appearances and hopefully trials. And, you know, trials are really fun. They're, they're just such an all-in experience and you like travel to the place and you, you know, focus on that one thing for weeks or months or however long it takes. And it's, it's really cool. So that's certainly not the case forever, but I do think that's something for, you know, folks in your position um, to think about like, you know, what, what, what do you want your kind of work-life balance to look like and your daily tasks to look like? Because I think if you don't have the personality that's kind of, you know, suited for this job, I do think it, it, it will feel like a trade-off, you know, and it will feel like Claude was saying those, those 2,100 hours or 2,000 hours or whatever it is that you have to bill is just going to be agonizing and it's going to be like, you know, watching the clock or something, but on a, you know, expanded um, year-long basis. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, and, and I will say now, as I've gotten a little bit more senior, some of the uh, work-life elements have sort of balanced out a little bit. Um, I was just noticing, for example, that like, I don't know, I used to work almost every weekend and I just kind of don't anymore because I think I have a little bit more, I, I have a little bit better control over my workload and um, uh, just a little bit more clout, honestly, with the people that I work with. So they know that, you know, I, I, I kind of don't have that like, you know, need to sort of prove myself. I mean, I, I still work weekends a, a fair amount, but it's not something that I feel like I have to do. So um, yeah, I just don't feel like there are a ton of challenges. I feel like it's a really great job and I'm still, you know, six years in, like very stoked that I, that I get to do it. And, um, you know, certainly there's a lot of great things that come from a, a long career in, in big law. You know, you get to do really fascinating work. It's intellectually, you know, just so, challenging and interesting. Like I said, we have some cases that, you know, we, we had like uh, one case that we filed in the Ninth Circuit, another that we filed in the first, and they've kind of come out differently. And so we're starting to like bubble something up to the Supreme Court, which is so cool. And of course, I'm not like the lead on that. We've got appellate, appellate practitioners, but, um, you know, I'm part of it because I did a lot of the district court stuff. And it's just so cool. So you get to do stuff like that. You know, I love the people I work with at O'Melveny. They're reasonable, brilliant, you know, just great people. And you get compensated well. I think it's a great gig. <laughs> so I'll stop there. That's great, Kristen. Um, Marcy, yeah. uh, trade-offs, challenges? So um, I was thinking about this when, when Claude and Kristen were talking. Um, and I would say that the challenges that I've seen have, you know, obviously changed as I've developed in my career. So I remember, although it's been a while when I first started practicing and I was an associate, I think the biggest challenges for me at that time were just billing my time, just, you know, feeling like there's this constant clock kind of on you and how are you going to capture all your time and there's a lot of focus. I mean, probably at any big firm, there's going to be focus on you know, billing their hours and capturing all your time. And that was definitely an adjustment, um, but it really is something that you, you know, do adjust to um, and you get better at doing it as, as time goes on. Um, I also, I remember when I first started out just struggling and chal being challenged to have support staff. I had never had a job before where I had a secretary and a case assistant paralegal and that type of thing under me. And um, I remember my, at that time, 75-year-old secretary kind of coming in my office one day and saying, here are some things I can do for you. And um, because I just didn't, you know, I didn't know what to ask her to do. And so those are kind of some of the challenges that um, I remember facing when I was a junior associate. As you get more, um, as I got more senior in my career and became more like a senior um, counsel or senior associate, at that time, I remember, um, you know, that the focus was more at that point on making sure that I was sort of proving myself to um, my coworkers 
um, you know, the partners that I was working with, because in my mind at that point, I was thinking like, well, you know, I want to be made partner and I need to, you know, reach these certain goals. And so I always tell people that, you know, when you go to law school, you typically law students kind of tend to be um, sort of a personality just in general. And then when you get those students are working all hard to, you know, you're, you're working hard to make the best grades you can to get the best job that you can while you're in law school. And then you then those people all funnel into the practice of law. And so you're surrounded by a lot of people like that. And there's kind of this constant rat race of, OK, well, now I'm an associate. Now I have to work really, really, really hard and become a partner because that's the next you know, track of where I am in my career. And so it's sort of this constant treadmill type feeling that you're on that can be um, challenging at times and it's very rewarding in other ways, but that wasn't the question <laughs> that was posed. Um, so yeah, I would say as a, as a senior counsel, I was more um, attuned to, to making sure that I was really a standout and the quality of my work, that I was trying to start to learn to market myself um, both internally and to start getting business for the firm so that I would be made partner. Now that, I've, now that I'm a partner, um, and I have been for, for several years, I would say that the challenges have shifted a lot more. Now it's more about things like, um, you know, pro concerns about profitability and, um, and, and making sure that the people that work under me are billing <laughs> appropriately and frustrations that involve things like chasing, you know, making sure my clients are paying and they're paying on time and, um, and just sort of the administrative side of being a partner um, is, is a challenge for me because quite frankly, I went to law school to practice law, didn't go to law school to be a business person, but that's part of being a lawyer and you find that out later. And, um, you know, it's, it's not one of the more satisfying parts of my job. I enjoy reaping the benefits of that. I like being profitable because I make more money um, and that's great, but I don't like, you know, I, I, I find it challenging to have to dedicate brain power to a lot of that stuff during the day. Um, doing, a, as, as you become more senior in your practice, another challenge is just, you end up doing a lot of non-billable work. So I do a lot of um, things that involved, you know, retention and making sure that the people that are at our firm are staying there and are happy and feel satisfied in their own job and are doing a good job. I do a lot of recruiting. I do a lot of, um, you know, just big picture type stuff to, to, with my fellow partners. And a lot of that is rewarding, but it can be very challenging because I still enjoy rolling up my sleeves and getting down and dirty in a case. And, you know, I still enjoy um, knowing, you know, drafting motions and arguing motions. And um, a lot of partners will sort of stop doing a lot of that type of work as they become more senior. But for me, I still enjoy doing it. So when I when I can, I still try to do as much of that as, as I can. Marcy, you, um, you mentioned something that was going to be the fodder for my next question, which was sort of how to manage the bureaucracy um, and perhaps politics of uh, a, a big firm, um, especially one with multiple offices around different parts of the country. Um, so maybe I'll turn to Claude. You know, how does, how does the bureaucracy and management of a firm, um, how does that influence your day-to-day -day life or did influence your day-to-day -day -day life? And what were some of the, the pros and cons of that aspect of it? Um, that's, a, that's a hard question. To, oh, that's a big question. Um, look, this is more of a life statement than anything else. Um, and, and every firm is different. Um, uh, some firms are far more egalitarian than others. Um, but at least in, in my experience, uh, a critical feature uh, to be immune from decisions of the firm writ large, I mean, the firm, the firm as a whole, is um, it's a function of your autonomy, your ability to have your own practice. Um, I was very, very fortunate in, in my 41 years of litigation practice to have at an early stage, really starting in my fifth year, to start developing clients, I was very aggressive um, I've, uh, in getting clients. It was a big. It was important to me um, uh, to have my own, have an independent practice. The judge that I clerked for advised me. He gave me a great 
um, homily that I that I kept very close to me, which was always have your bags packed. Uh, my father also gave me strong advice about being independent. Now, the reason I emphasize that is that if you develop your own client base, um, that is to say, you, uh, there's, you have two audiences as a trial lawyer. You have your outside audience, which is the, the, the world where you can get, uh, try to get clients. And then there's the, in, the inside audience or infirm audience, which is convincing your partners or associates that they should give you work. Um, I was always very, very focused on the outside audience, whereas the vast majority of partners that I work with and lawyers I work with sort of are dependent on the work that they get from their colleagues. Um, and I, I go through all that because the answer to your question, Scott, is that um, the firm's machinations, the firm's politics, uh, what's going on in the firm is definitely going to affect you if you're dependent on a lot of other people in the firm. Um, I think the more independence you have, the more you are, uh, you, can, you are independent of those, but you're less dependent on those sorts of changes uh, and decisions by the firm. Another point is to try, and this, is, this was never my road to success, but it is the road to success of others. Some people are very interested in becoming involved in firm politics or in firm leadership. Um, I never was. Uh, uh, the, I was asked to be the managing partner of Quinn Emanuel Silicon Valley office when I got there in 2003. And I ended up managing the office for 12 years and hated it. I mean, it was just, it, I don't think it was in my skill set. And it was uh, something that I prefer to others do. But um, that's, uh, I, I think that's, I hope that's responsive to your question, Scott, that uh, I think autonomy and independence um, are a, an important cure to, uh, to being dependent on the firm's politics and its administrative decisions. And failing that, I guess, getting involved in the firm's politics and administrative decisions so that you don't feel um, victimized. Kristen, uh, how does the you know, management issues or bureaucracy issues, <coughs> excuse me, special, especially with multiple offices, uh, affect your practice? Yeah. Um, so as the most junior person out of the three people speaking today, I'll just say I'm I'm still somewhat immune from what I would call kind of the bureaucracy or you know large scale firm management. Um, O'Melveny does have a number of offices, but um, we're we actually have a, a fairly small number of offices all all together in the United States. We have a few in Asia and Europe, but in the U.S., it's um, you know, we've got San Francisco, we're based out of Los Angeles, so we have three offices kind of in the LA area, and then we've got New York, DC. We just opened one, and I think actually two in Texas. Um, but so my point is, is that we, we've got like, you know, you can count on maybe two hands, the number of offices we have in um, the United States, whereas with some firms, it's, it's much, much larger. Um, I do work with folks in all of the offices, and if you're someone who's interested in uh, staying at the firm and becoming partner, you know, it does become important for you to work with people in your practice group, at least, who are, you know, outside of the, the single office that you work at. And so, you know, how you get that work, um, I mean, I, I don't want to go too much into, into the weeds on on how work coordination works at O'Melveny, but um, you know, generally speaking, we, we have formal processes to make that happen, but um, in, in my practice, it's happened more by just doing good work for the partners here in San Francisco, kind of getting your name on the map. And then you know, a lot of our needs are cross office. Um, and that's actually been facilitated by the pandemic and everyone working remotely. It's, it's much more easier and it's much easier. And I think kind of more natural, um, to say, oh, let's just get someone, you know, even if we have a New York case, let's get someone in San Francisco to help with that. Um, it, it's almost become, like I said, more natural to do that in this environment versus when everyone was, you know, working in their kind of cabined off, um, physical offices. So, um, so yeah, but my biggest piece of sort of advice or, or tip, if all of you were, you know, to, to work as um, big law attorneys and kind of navigating that, I, I think 
the most important um, element for all of this, kind of the question of navigating bureaucracy and kind of the larger, um, the bigger picture of things beyond just the work that you're doing is to get a mentor. And that's, you know, it sounds like such a simple and kind of cliche thing, but it's true. Um, you know, you need someone to kind of guide you through this big, <laughs> you know, and, and complex organization that, that most large law firms are. Um, and I think that it's best if that happens, you know, kind of organically. And if you get someone who can vouch for you, you know, because that's really what it is, not just a mentor, but kind of a, a champion, you know, who can kind of say, hey, this person's doing really good work. You know, let me kind of elevate you to, to other people and other projects as well. Um, and, it, you know, Claude was talking about, like, how do you get clients and, and things like that? And again, that's something that I'm, you know, just now starting to get better at. But I've asked, like, my mentors at the firm, you know, basically, how do you do that? <laughs> like, how, how does one go about doing that? And from what I've heard, you know, it starts with, first of all, when you're, you know, brand new, you think of the partners as your clients. And so your job in your first few years is to do really excellent work for the partners. Um, you know, that that is like my number one piece of advice is, is to think of the partners as, as your clients and, you know, take care of the partners, kind of make their job easy, right? Remind them of things, you know, kind of take on more than the discrete question or task that's being given to you, like all of those things. And then partners will see that's how you treat them. And so they feel comfortable kind of passing you off to the client. Um, and from what I've heard, at least at O'Melveny, and I mean, I think this is true of most law firms, we've got, um, you know, a number of institutional clients. And so one of the first uh, kind of inroads to, to like being a partner and being someone who really kind of nurtures these, these clients and the relationships is just doing really good work for the institutional clients. And then having a part of your practice that's also kind of hustling and going out there and, um, you know, getting new business and kind of promoting yourself. So, um, yeah, that, that's not something that I'm super intimately familiar with right now. It's actually like one of my major goals for the next year is to do kind of some more, um, you know, profile raising and things like that. Things that you need that a person needs to do in order to to attract new business. Um, the last thing I will say about this, I was just thinking this as, as we were, as Claude was talking, um, is that the reality is that most people who come into big law firms do not stay for the long term and don't become partners. And I think that these sorts of issues are kind of only things that, that really become a big part of what you should be concerned about if you're someone who wants to make partner at a big law firm. And that's something that generally takes a few years to sort of assess if it's what you want to do, if you're at the right place to do it, you know, all of those things. So um, I, I don't think any of you should be, um, you know, overly concerned with that at the stage where you are. Like I said, if, if you guys are planning to go into big law firms in the next few years, just do really good work for the partners. And then I think you can take it from there. Uh, Marcy, I know you started off um, with some thoughts about this, but I wanted to round it out with you and give you another chance to add anything else about navigating bureaucracy or politics of a firm. Yeah, I mean, I would just say I, I agree with Kristen. I think it, your, who your allies are or your mentors are really important when it comes to that. They um, absolutely have the knowledge and connections to be able to help you navigate through that. Um, I was fortunate enough when I first started at the firm that my mentor, who is still my mentor today, happened at that time to be our managing partner of our firm. And um, although he's on a very long um, phase out to retirement that seems like it's been going on for a long time, I'm happy to keep him as long as possible. He is still serves as my mentor. And when there are still kind of some sticky situations, I still turn to him and get advice and guidance. And there have been many times where he's had to go you know, have some difficult conversations on my behalf with other people. And so it's really nice to, to know, to, to find that person. I would say, don't try to force that relationship. Try to just find somebody who you connect with well. And I, you know, in turn, I, I mentor a, a, lot, a lot of people at the firm and try to kind of do the same thing. So I, that's sort of the biggest thing. Um, I, I do think it's important to get involved 
um, in, in some capacity. I also am not, I don't love to, to get involved in the management like Claude as well. Um, I just, it's not really where my passion lies, but I do, I am actively, I'm an active partner and, um, and I um, am part of sort of our core partnership leadership team within our group. And so I think that that's, you know, important to have control over um, your own destiny. Um, it's a lot easier to, to be involved in those discussions. And then, um, you know, I would just say kind of what, what I've learned, and I guess I've sort of learned this the hard way, is sort of know when to, um, I don't want to say fight, but know when to advocate on your own behalf internally, and then know when to step back and not do that. And, um, and a lot of times with a mentor, that can be very helpful because you know, they're at, in a large law firm, there's lots of personalities and there's lots of politics that go on. Um, it's not just, you know, it's not just Gordon and Reese. This happens anywhere when you get a lot of people, especially a lot of lawyers involved who, you know, are all out there trying to, you know, trying to make sure that both the firm and, and they make money um, and are profitable. And so um, when you get that um, type of people, you're going to meet difficult personalities. And, um, and so you just have to, just like you will when you practice law, you have to know um, when do you push and when do you just say, okay, thank you, and sort of make a mental note in your head about that person and, you know, what your interactions are going to be like with that person going forward. Um, so, you know, it, it's, um, it, it's just one of the things that you have to deal with um, probably anywhere. I think it's more profound the larger that the firm probably is. Great. Well, I'd like to open it up to the students for questions. I'm sure they have some. I have more too, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll make sure the students get a chance to ask. But in the meantime, I'm going to uh, stop recording so that I can